Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay. Um, your next homework assignments due on Tuesday, and then we're going to have our midterm exam on Tuesday. We've already talked about what that will be like. And so, um, good luck studying. You know, let me know if you've got any questions. There will be an Excel problem on the exam, so please bring a computer that day. The only computer I'd be able to loan you, um, its main cooling fan is non-functional, so I'm just waiting for it to eventually burst into flames one of these days when I do turn it on. And, you know, Murphy's Law says it would happen during your exam. So that's how we could force it to finally burst into flames. Um, your design project is going to be assigned today. We're going to be talking about that pretty extensively. And the first part of it, phase one, is due on Thursday, March 2nd. I like to assign this project in nice digestible bits because I find that if we divide it up into pieces and have draft submissions along the way, it becomes a lot more manageable and it reduces the stress levels considerably. So your first submission on that is the March 2nd, and you know, it, that's on the course schedule. So if you're ever never quite certain when things are due, you can refer back to the course schedule for that. Any questions related to these announcements? All right, so the first thing we're going to do today is um, talk about a little more on pumps, uh, something called the affinity laws. Just to make it uh, easier for you to concentrate on affinity laws, I know we're all excited to get started on water gems, but to help you focus on affinity laws, I'd suggest maybe shutting down the laptop or putting it in standby just until we get to that point. Okay, these affinity laws, sometimes called scaling laws, are a way of figuring out how pumps behave at conditions other than their normal operating points. And what I mean by that is that sometimes pumps are put together by a manufacturer in families and sizes that are very closely related. And there's a picture here of two different pumps. That there's the mini-me pump and the normal pump. And they have sort of the in same internal uh, shape, but it's just a scaled up size. This might be a three inch version of the pump and this is a four inch version of the pump. Now, in addition to changes in the diameter of the um, of the impeller. There may also be, for the same pump, changes in how it behaves when we operate it at one rotational speed compared to another. And so if we have one pump rotating at 1200 RPMs, then we'll get a certain pump performance curve. But then if we spin it at a different speed, we'll get a different performance curve. And you'll remember in the previous class when we were looking at those performance curves, uh, let's see, here was that one from a manufacturer. The curve showed for a 6 inch, a 7 inch, an 8 inch, and so on. So these are the different families of sizes. And there was another one where it was showing for a certain size how it behaved at different rotational rates. And so here was 1,200, 1,600, 2,000, and so on. We don't always have this table. Uh, we don't always have a figure provided by the manufacturer. And so if we know one curve, it's possible to predict how the, the pump is going to behave under different conditions using these scaling laws. And here are the scaling laws. Thou shalt scale. Uh, those are the scaling laws. This is taken from the FE Supplied Reference Manual, version 9.4. If you go on to the website of NCWES, you can download this and start acquainting yourself with how the formulas look so that when you take the FE, it's not all confusing. Now, you have a huge advantage compared to people who took the FE a couple of years ago because in the past, it was a paper reference manual, and it had an index, but there were lots of things that weren't in the index. Nowadays, when you're taking the FE exam on the computer, you can search the reference manual by keyword. And so if you have an idea of, oh, I, this is a Manning's problem, and you just put Manning's into the search bar, it'll go find the equation for you. So you can really save a lot of time. In any case, these are the scaling laws. And uh, let me explain a little bit about what's going on with them. These subscripts, 2 and 1, it basically is meant to represent how the situation is in one situation compared to another. So it could be 
um, the case of the three inch pump compared to the four inch pump. And so we'd say this is pump one and that's pump two. And then we'd be comparing their parameters according to these relationships. It could be the same pump, but just operated at different rotational speeds. So the way that we'll solve these is we'll have a pump performance curve like this, just a given pump performance curve, and we'll use the scaling laws to find out how is that performance curve different at, for example, different diameters. So you'll notice here D is representing the diameters. And so rather than just saying doubling the diameter is going to double the uh, performance curve, it's not a linear relationship like that. And these ratios help you to identify exactly what the relationship is. And so in some ways, it's a little bit related to what we were doing with dimensional analysis in chapter eight of last semester's fluid mechanics. Uh, but we'll go through a couple of illustrations just to show how you can find out how a pump is behaving under new conditions or with a different size. Um, by the way, these formulas also apply not only for pumps, but also for blowers in wastewater treatment. There are a lot of situations where people use blowers to provide uh, oxygen to the uh, treatment system or in fans like in building, uh, heating, cooling, air conditioning. So these apply to situations where you've got an impeller connected to a motor, in other case, in other words. All right, so here is uh, the situation. We have a pump that we already know the performance curve for. Here is the performance curve. And actually, let me rewrite that a different way. H sub P is kind of the notation we've been using for pump head according to the book's definitions, but you'll notice here, it just says capital H for head rather than H sub P. So just to clarify for the substitutions that we're gonna be doing here in a minute, I'm gonna replace the H sub P with a capital H. But you know what it means, it means the pump head. So we know the performance curve when it's an eight inch impeller that's spinning at 1200 RPM. Now in situation A, it's asking, well, what if we spin that same 8-inch impeller twice as fast? What if we go from 1,200 RPM and we boost it up to 2,400 RPM? So in that case, we can assign the, uh, the original values, like we have the uh, N1 is 1,200 RPM. D1 in this case is eight inches. And uh, we already have the relationship here for the pump performance curve, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna change that and I'm gonna write H1 is equal to 12 minus 0 0.1 Q1 squared. So the one just is meaning original flavor, all right? The original flow rate, the original head, original rotational rate, original diameter. Question A is saying, what if we have the same diameter, so D2 hasn't changed, it's still eight inches, but we have a new rotational rate, N1 is now 2400 RPM. We want to find the relationship between pump head and flow rate. So in other words, we want to know H2 is something minus something Q2 squared. That's going to be the form of our answer. Yes, it would. Thank you. I'm glad you noticed that. Right. So it's the, the second case rotational rate. Exactly. So what we're going to do is use the scaling laws to relate uh, substitutions. We're going to substitute things into the original pump performance curve based on the scaling laws. And so which scaling laws apply in this case? We've got one, two, three, four, five to choose from. Well, there's nothing in our problem specifically where we're calculating the power before and after, so it's not this bottom one. We're not calculating, based on the problem description, the pressure rise, so it's not the second from the bottom. But this middle one 
We do have to use that relationship. The one immediately above it, mass flow rate, we're not uh, dealing with mass flow rate, but the one on the top where it's the ratio of the flow rates, the rotational rates and diameters, those two, that, that also applies. And so the scaling laws that are relevant to us are Q and D cubed for case two is equal to Q and D cubed for case one. And then the other one is H divided by N squared D squared for situation two is equal to H divided by N squared D squared for situation one. So here's what I'd like you to do. Substitute in the actual values in each place. Um, Q, we don't have an actual value, so that stays as a variable. So N and D, we do have numbers for that. So this first scaling law is going to give us a ratio of Q2 and Q1 that we can substitute into our existing um, performance curve. And so what you want to know is Q1 equals something Q2 from that. And then from this other one, you're going to find H1 compared to H2. And you're going to substitute that into the original performance curve. And so there will be a substitution for Q1, and there will be a substitution for H1, and then it will give us our new uh, performance curve. So let me pause the recording, give you a couple of minutes to run through those calculations and find the ratios, and then I'll show you uh, what the solution looks like. You find uh, Q2 in terms of Q1 and H2 in terms of H1 substituted into the original performance curve and then that gives you the new performance curve at the different rotational rate. Yes? No, uh, we have to know how H1 and H2 behaves because, um, because the rotational rate affects them in a different way than it affects the Qs. You'll notice that here it's, it's just uh, n to the first power, but it was n squared for the heads. Into this equation? Mm-hmm. Sure. Mm-hmm. And you got the same answer? That's great. Yeah. Sounds good. So the, uh, the next thing I'd like you to take a look at is, now, what if we're using the same original motor, 1200 RPM, but we change to a different diameter? So D1 will be the 8-inch diameter and D2 will be the 10-inch diameter. So what does the pump performance curve look like in that case? And then once you solve for it, consider uh, question C. It's asking something, it's kind of a review question in a way. It's something I hope that you remember. It, uh, maybe you can consider it as exam prep because it's, uh, we've talked about what those pump performance curves can be interpreted as like the, in the physical sense well, I won't say too much, not yet. So again, we have to know the relationship between Q1 and Q2. 
and the relationship between H1 and H2. And once that's defined by the scaling laws, you can substitute it into the original performance curve and get the updated performance curve under the new conditions. And so in this case, we are increasing the diameter to 10 inches, operating it at the same 1,200 RPM. And um, so that's increasing the uh, cutoff head a little bit. The 12, remember, uh, that this value, we call it the cutoff head. And if we were graphically representing what that performance curve looks like, Here's the typical shape of the performance curve, where we have flow rate on the x-axis, pump head on the vertical axis. And what the intercept represents is the maximum amount of head that a pump can add at zero flow rate. If you have a little bit less head than that, then now it can finally actually start moving some water. So, in part C of the example, it was asking, if you need to pump water 30 feet above the source, which option is best? Which option meaning the original pump and its corresponding uh, pump performance curve, or either of these other two performance curves that we derived? This one, which was with the 10-inch impeller, or this one, which was operating at 2,400 RPM? Anybody have an idea of which of the three options might be the best choice? Which one? The 2400, you're right. That's the best choice. In fact, it's the only choice that will work at all. And why is that? 48, yeah. So this pump can lift water a maximum of 48 feet, and any less than that, and it will be operating at a higher flow rate. So it's good. But the other two pump performance curves indicate a cutoff head of 18 feet or a cutoff head of 12 feet. And so they simply wouldn't be able to push water even a fraction of a liter per second. It would just be no flow whatsoever. The, the pump would be just locked up struggling to lift the water that 30 feet and uh, not successful. Okay. This happens to be the last of the new material that will be included on the exam. Uh, the rest of what we're going to be talking about today is more oriented towards the design project. Any questions on the affinity laws before we move on to the design project type stuff? No? That's a great question. Yeah, there is. And I think the best way to represent that is to look back here at these. Um, yeah, I think that there's an upper limit where, you know, beyond a certain RPMs, probably it's just introducing more turbulence than adding additional energy. And I don't know what the upper limit would be for a certain pump. Um, but they don't continue on forever. So. All right. Now, you may remember that when we were talking about the Hardy-Cross method, we had this example. Right? Remember this example? Of course you do. You remember this example. Let's solve it with water gems. So fire up those computers. If you got water gems installed, that's great. If you weren't able to install it, that's fine. You can just follow along. Um, Today is going to be my first day of using version 10 of Water Gems. And I took a sneak peek before class, and they have moved around some of the functions, where, like where they are located in the menu structure. So hopefully we don't run into a brick wall. We'll give it our best shot. Okay, the first thing I want to point out is uh, junction A is what we're going to call a control point. That's where the pressure is defined. It's the only place in the network where we know what the pressure is. And since it's defined as 600 kilopascals, we can, from that, determine what is the total head at junction A. And the way we do that is just dividing the uh, pressure by the unit weight. And so I'm going to say the head at A is the pressure at A divided by the unit weight. 
In other words, the pressure is 600 kPa, and the unit weight of water at 20 degrees Celsius is 9.790 newtons per meter cubed, which means that's 61.285 meters of head. We'll just keep that in our pockets for now. We're going we're gonna to need it later. All right, so um, here is uh, Water Gems Connect, which is what they're calling version 10. The annoying thing I've noticed since I installed Connect is now I, I guess every time I reboot my computer, it's going to want me to log in to Bentley or something like that. I'm hoping I can disable that feature. Um, but we're going to just... Uh, create a new hydraulic model. So you can follow along if it's working. It knew I was talking bad about it. There, new hydraulic model. There's two ways to draw models. One is just as a schematic where the lines you draw are like symbolic representations of the pipe. And then another way to do it is a scaled drawing, where the location of the pipe and where you have the starting point and the end point defines the length of the elements. <coughs> Excuse me. For now, let's just draw it as a schematic system rather than as an actual scaled drawing. And here on the Home tab, you'll notice this Layout tool. We're going to start, click on Layout, and then once you click on Layout and start bringing the cursor into the drawing area, you'll notice that there is a, a circle. That means it's a junction. So if I click the left button right now, it's going to drop a junction, and that's fine. So I'm going to drop a junction. This is going to define, this is point A, and I'll go down a little bit. This is my point F. Over here is D. Up for B. And then it went over to there again. And escape will stop drawing. And then I want to pick things up again here at junction 2. And there was one in the middle. And then it splits this. If I get close enough and I click, it'll ask me the question, do you want to split the pipe? And I'll say yes. So just to uh, refresh your memory of how this compares to this one, here was the original. Just get a quick glance of that and draw some sort of representation that's that same shape. A, F, E, C, D, B. Okay, so here's my schematic of it. It, it doesn't look exactly the same, but that's all right. I'm going to go in and override the lengths that it has in the back of its mind based on where I clicked. I'm going to give it what's, what are called user-defined lengths. Okay, um, something else I need to do is from the drawing, I knew that the pressure here was 600 kilopascals. And the way that I fix that is by having a reservoir connected to it. So right click and it, see where it says junction. We want to change from junction to a reservoir. And so we're going to drop a reservoir in the immediate vicinity of that junction and then right click again to change from reservoir back to junction and click on this first one. So we've, what we've got right now is our network and the reservoir. What I'd like to do is to change the name of those junctions so that it matches the, uh, the drawing that I know, so that it, it matches the notations that are used here in this drawing. By the way, here are the flow rates that we came up with when we use the uh, the Hardy Cross method. So what I'm hoping is that the flow rates we get out of water gems are pretty close to the flow rates we got when we were solving this by the spreadsheet method. Okay. So I'm going to rename these junctions by opening up a flex table for the junctions. So here on the Home tab in the ribbon, see where it says Flex Tables? Have it do this drop down, and we're going to choose the Junction Flex Table. It's a lot quicker to edit them all in a group rather than clicking on each element individually. So when you bring up the junction flex table, I'm going to just go here under the label and change it. I don't want it to call it J1. I want that to be A. And let's see, J4 is the what I was calling B. So rename the elements. 
to match. Junction 5 is my E. Junction 3, let's see, that was D, which leaves F. Great. Some other things I could enter here is if I knew the elevation of each of these junctions, I could enter that in, like the ground elevation. I'm just going to assume that they're all on the same plane and that they have an elevation of zero. What I'm going to have to do is define the elevation of the water in the reservoir so that I'm forcing the pressure at junction A to be equal to the 600 kPa that's given in the problem statement. So I've got junction names. I could go in and rename these pipes if I wanted to. I'm not going to bother with that, but what I am going to do is I'm going to turn off the labels for the pipes. They're not adding anything. So I'm going over here to the left window, and I'm turning off the annotations for the pipe labels. That just cleans up the image a little bit. And if you want, you can zoom in as well. I assume that's uh, view zoom extents, and that will fill the screen with whatever you've drawn so far. All right, so there's some things we have to tell the model. It doesn't know right now what the diameter of the pipes are. It doesn't know the lengths of the pipes. It doesn't know what the pipe is made out of. And it also doesn't know what flow rates are being drawn out and where. So all that information we have to give to the simulator before it's able to tell us the pressures and the flow rates. So let's go and open up the flex table for the pipes. And when you have the flex pipe table open, we're able to um, define the lengths. And so what I was calling pipe AB, for example, I can, in the start node and the stop node, find AB. That pipe has a length, according to the drawing, of 220 meters. If you have your notes from class before, it may be easier for you to, uh, to type all the stuff in because... Um, and I'll occasionally pull it up on the screen here. But what I'm going to be entering in the next couple of moments is I'm going to be entering in the pipe lengths and the pipe diameters for each element in the network. All right, so AB had a, a diameter of 500 millimeters and a length of 220. Now, to define the length, I have to turn this thing on has user-defined length because that's how it knows to override what it thinks the length is based on where I click. So I'm going to turn that on for all of them. And rather than clicking over and over again, I can do a global edit by right-clicking at the top of the menu, global edit, set the value to a check mark, and then it will do all of them. So they all have user-defined lengths. Mm-hmm. Great question. Um, you have to do it at the beginning. And uh, so that's one of the things that's like a hard learned lesson. I guess I maybe should have mentioned that at the very beginning, that um, anytime you open up the program, you have to make sure you're in the right unit system. And then before we execute the model, we want to make sure that you're in uh, Darcy Wiesbach rather than Hayes and Williams for the calculation approach. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The place that uh, I recommend you do it is here under Tools, More, Options, and then Units. You can choose between SI and US Customary. And so we're going to do this one in SI units. Now, the tricky thing is, is that when you switch the units, it doesn't always um, immediately show up, like in the flex tables. Y you can like he was mentioning, open up the pipe network and then I can right click on uh, the units of diameter, for example, and units and formatting, I can have it switch from millimeters to whatever else I want. But the, the way that you can have everything changed over to the unit system that you want is just at the beginning, before you start drawing anything, doing tools, options, 
and then units, choosing SI. But if you've already drawn your network and you like it and you don't want to start over from scratch, then you can go into the flex tables and uh, change the units there. Do you have a question? Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be exactly at A. No. Nope. What we're going to do is we're going to make it a short length and a big diameter so that there's no energy lost through the pipe. And so then, it, you know, it, it essentially is forcing the pressure we want at junction A. Okay, so uh, going through the process of assigning the, uh, the diameters and lengths to all those pipes. So here I turned on user-defined length, and you can see length user-defined. I'm going to drag that over so that it's closer to where these diameters are that I'm keying in. So this one that was 500 uh, millimeters also has a length of 220 meters. And let's see, pipe... AF. If I go to the drawing for pipe AF, that one was 400 millimeters and had a length of 180. Okay, pipe DF, looking on my drawing here, that's 200 meters long and 500 millimeters in diameter. Okay, so 500 millimeters in diameter. That's DF. 200. All right. EF is 80 meters and 700 millimeters. CD is 850 for the diameter and oh, 850. And then for the length is just um, 80. A, B, C, 650 and 100, C, E, 600 and 150, and finally the pipe from junction A to the reservoir. I mentioned that I'm going to make that really high just because um, if you make the diameter large, then that means there's going to be essentially no friction losses there. I'll make the length of the pipe five meters long. So that's going to force the pressure at A to be whatever corresponds to the depth of water at the reservoir. It said in that initial uh, problem, it said that the equivalent sand roughness is 0.3 millimeters. And that's related to the material that the pipe is made out of. As it ends up, if you pull open the material properties for ductile iron, we can do that. Um, here, the ellipsis, the little dot, dot, dot next to ductile iron, if you pull that up, it has a library of different types of materials that pipe can be made out of. And if we scroll down here to the ductile iron, you'll notice that it's saying the roughness height is 0 .0003 which is the 0.3 millimeters that it was stating in the problem statement. So we're just going to stick with the default material that it chose for all of those pipes as ductile iron. That'll be fine. Okay, so what does it know already? It knows how long the pipes are, what they're made out of, and the diameter of the pipes. What it doesn't know is how much water is coming out of the system. And we know from the uh, sketch here that there is uh, water coming out at E and water coming out at B. So I need to put that into the network now. I'm going to say here at junction E, I can open up the uh, flex table for the junctions. Maybe. stopped working. That's fantastic. So I guess now's a good time for me to say it's always important to save your work because you never know when the program's going to crash, right? 
I didn't save my work, so I think we're probably going to lose this. Oh, wait. Okay, well, I got lucky. I'm going to save my work. All right, so uh, example. All right, now I got my bases covered. You never want to be running version 10.000 like with no updates. They just barely released this, and so we're the beta testers in a sense. Yeah. Okay, so um, we're going to define the flow rates, the demands, right? And we do that through the junction table. And here in the junction table, one of the things that it says is demand collection. And we have demand coming out at E and at B. And so here for E, on demand collection, I'm going to click on the ellipsis, the little dot, dot, dot there. And I'm going to tell it that its base demand is 1,600 liters per second because that corresponds to the 1.6 cubic meters per second. Okay, so I've got that. I close it. And the other one was junction B. And so I'll click on the ellipsis there. And it is a flow rate of 600 liters per second at that spot. Okay, so now it knows the flow rate coming out. Let's compare it to the sketch. Right. There's flow coming in in two locations here, at A and at D. And uh, so we're going to have to provide a reservoir at both locations. Okay. So let's put in a reservoir at location D with this layout tool here. Again, it's locked up. It's a bad sign. All right. I guess I just need to close that error message over and over again. So layout, right click, get a uh, reservoir. I'm going to drop the reservoir near it and connect it near the junction there. OK. And what we knew from our uh, previous solution, in that example, we calculated the, uh, the pressures at each location. Let's see, where was that solution? We knew that the pressure at junction D was ahead of 57.83. So these are going to be the water elevations that I assign for those two reservoirs. Okay, so let me go now into here, and I'm going to go to the flex table for the reservoirs. And reservoir 1 is at A. That needs to have the 61.265. 61.265. And then the reservoir for the other one. We need to have a pressure at junction D is, uh, okay, 57.83. All right. So two sources of inflow, two locations where there's outflow. Mm-hmm. It is for reservoir one, 61.285. Yeah. And you can get to the elevation either through the flex table or if you select and just double click on an element, it'll bring up a menu that has all of the physical properties for each element. And so here under elevation, it's the physical elevation 61.27 for the uh, reservoir that's at A. And then the reservoir that's at D is going to be 57.83. So let me write that on the screen. 57. So the head at D is 57.83. All right. So we can calculate the model now by clicking on the compute button. And what it's going to do is it knows that water's coming out of the network at two spots and it knows where it can get that water from. We don't have to tell the program 
to suck the water from the reservoirs. It'll just automatically do that. Um, so I'm going to click on the compute button now. Green is good. If, uh, if we had forgotten something, then it would give us like a little error message with a red exclamation point there. But that didn't happen. It draws flow directions. And we can get some of the answers of how much the flow rates are by looking in the flex tables. We can go into the uh, pipe flex table, for example. And it will tell me what is the flow rate through each of the elements. But it's even, I don't know, easier if you put some annotations onto the drawing. So rather than just having these pipe labels, which are useless, I'm going to create a new annotation. I'm going to right click on where it says the word pipe. And I'm going to do a new annotation. And the field that I wanted to annotate is the flow rate. So absolute flow, because I don't want it to show the negative sign. Uh, so absolute flow. And then uh, I'm going to put a prefix here of Q equals. And you'll notice that if I click on apply, then it puts the flow rate right on top of the pipe which is a little inconvenient. So I'm going to offset the location of that. Let's do 5 and 5 and see where that puts us for this initial offset. That seems pretty good. Well, at least over here. It's a little bit jumbled there, right? So let's compare some of those flow rates. Um, there are some differences for sure. It's saying that it's going to take from this reservoir 1.9 cubic meters per second. But in our problem, when we were doing this, it was taking 1 cubic meter per second from this reservoir and uh, 1.2 meters per second from D. And the point that what WaterGems knows is that since there's more pressure at A, it's going to be drawing a greater fraction of the flow from that reservoir. So there are some differences. I guess when we set this example up, it wasn't taking into consideration what the pressures were at junction D by defining that inflow. You know, in other words, it would be drawing water from a source of higher energy before it drew water from junction D. So we're going to have some other times where we come back and do other examples with water gems. The main reason I wanted to show you basically just how to do a schematic drawing like this is because I'm giving you the project handout today. And the first part of the project isn't using water gems. The first part of the project is something different. But I think it's helpful for you to know water gems as early as possible because it's the tool that you're going to do most of your calculations with. Yes? No, it, it doesn't annotate that. I mean, uh, we could create a new junction annotation that had the outflows. But if we double click on the element, then remember that demand collection here. It'll show the demand of 1.6 cubic meters per second. But the reason it's not showing it yet is we don't have any annotations yet for the junctions. I think that we could put a demand collection annotation on there. Let's see if, if we put demand, if it shows. Yeah, there it is. So we could put the prefix on there and apply it, an offset. And now it's showing the, the demand at the, uh, at the junctions. So that's like a basic workflow of how you set up a model. Um, the next thing I'm going to show you later on is how you could import an image into the background. And then based on where you're clicking on the image, it'll actually scale the pipe length so that you don't have to use or define, but rather you can just use an image in the background and draw on top of that. Here's the design project. What you're going to be doing in the design project is you're going to have to figure out for a hypothetical city where the pipe should go and how big the pipe should be according to some constraints that are defined. Uh, the constraints are that 
in this town, which is on a hillside, these uh, brownish, reddish lines here are indicating elevation contours. And so A is at a high elevation, and the, the town is sloping downward in the direction towards the cardboard box factory. You'll notice that there are three interior zones within the city limits. There's the north zone, south, and east. Um, inside of those zones, there's going to be a certain fraction of like um, residential area, commercial areas, like where there's businesses and some industrial areas. Each one of you is going to have different assignments on uh, population density and the number of businesses. There's a table that I'm going to be putting onto MU Online that for each name shows your assignment for the population density. So for example, um, this is a scaled map. The printers were down today, which is why I wasn't able to print out an actual physical copy of this map to hand to you. But I'll bring that uh, next time we meet so that what you can do is take a ruler and you can measure what's the area of the north zone. And then you're going to look on the parameter assignments and maybe you'll have 100 people per hectare as your population density. And so you'd multiply your population density by the area of the north zone and that would tell you how many people are living in there. So let me ask you this. If you know how many people are living in the north zone, then how much water should you give them? None, Google. Google means in like an infinite amount. Or you mean you're going to Google search it. Good. Uh, I also have a handout that I'm going to be posting on MU Online that's like some typical parameters related to like the per capita water usage. And um, like one rule of thumb is uh, around 220 liters per person per day. You know, and it varies from city to city. It varies from state to state. But there's some data that you'll have access to that says, based on how many people are there, what's the water demands. And the way that you supply the water to the people in the north zone is with these two green arrows. So you'll notice that there's an arrow at M and a green arrow at A. So those two green arrows are feeding water to the interior of the city and at the north zone. The south zone has two arrows at L and O. And you just, however much water is demanded in the south zone, you split it in half, and you're feeding it to the south zone through those two locations. It's not like there's a big, like, fire hose and all the people just have to lap it up off the road. It's just that what you're designing is like the main uh, network arteries. And there would be later, smaller lateral pipes, but since this is like a land development kind of a case study, what you're having to size is like the main uh, pipeline and not necessarily every small pipe in the interior part of the network. Yeah? Is that sports stadium Each one of you is going to have different definitions of what the sports stadium is. Uh, some of you will have a sports stadium that may have 100,000 people there on game day, and some of you will have a stadium that's maybe 500 people on game day. And so a sports stadium, how much water do they use during game day? You know, I've got some data on that, believe it or not, which says, you know, per person in a stadium over the course of four hours, they're using 10 liters. And so what you'll be doing is you're going to be designing your pipe network so that it supplies enough city to the network, no, enough water to the, to the city's network um, on like the worst case scenario. Like what's the worst case scenario? It's when the city is fully built out at maximum capacity during the summer uh, when there's a fire someplace and uh, when maybe people are irrigating their grass because it's the hottest day of the year, you got to irrigate your grass, right? So I mean, you're, you want to design this network so that it doesn't fail. And what we define failure as is the pressure gets too low. No one in this network should experience pressure lower than 240 kilopascals during the peak condition. And at the same time, at, in the middle of the night when nobody's really using very much water, the static pressure shouldn't exceed 850 kilopascals. You know, the pressure goes low during the day because there's lots of demands and lots of head loss through the pipes. But then at night, when there's very little flow, then the head losses are going to be very minuscule. And so it's just sort of where on the hillside you're placing the reservoir that defines the pressure in the rest of the network. 
Was there a question in the back? Yes. The viscosity of beer, it's, it depends on if it's American beer or German beer. <laughs> That's a great idea. Yes. What you're going to do in one of the parts of the project is you're going to size a reservoir, like a tank, up on the hillside because um, the water in this city comes from a spring at a steady flow rate. But like you're starting to indicate, in the middle of the day, people are using a lot more water than at night. And there has to be some sort of a way to uh, balance out the fluctuations. And so one of the phases of this project, which I'll tell you how to do, is to size a, a tank, a storage reservoir, so that there's enough water through the course of the day. Yeah. Yes, you are. Uh, you're going to be taking consideration of how much the pipes cost because um, putting in a big pipe, I mean, it's easy to build a network that never fails if you just make all of the pipes enormous, right? Problem solved. Make the pipes gigantic and then everyone will always have plenty of water pressure. But um, the city will go bankrupt if every single pipe is a meter in diameter. So what you're trying to do is be really stingy. You're trying to make the pipe sizes just barely big enough. Just barely big enough so that the people don't have any more than the 240 kilopascals than they should. So there's, there's going to be an optimization process where you're trying to minimize the cost of the network. And the parameters on page three, you'll, you'll see that the things you're having to pay for are the pipe and the storage tank. And so you're having to find out the, the cost of this project related to the amount of pipe you're using and the uh, storage tank. So there's, no set budget. there's no set budget. That's right. And everyone will be different because um, some people are going to have sparsely populated towns with very few people. Some people are going to really have high, high density plate, high density towns with uh, the pipes have to be larger. Okay, so on the handout I've just given you, it's important for you to read this and we're going to continue to have discussions, but what you need to be focusing on right now is phase one, demand forecasting. Because that's what uh, you're submitting on, what was it, March 2nd? It says right here, Thursday, March 2nd. So what you're going to be doing on demand forecasting is you're going to be looking at your parameters for population density, and that, that file is also going to tell you how big the hospital it is, how, like how many beds are in the hospital. That file is going to be telling you uh, how many like, rooms there are in the high-density housing project. It'll be telling you the size of the sports stadium and so on. So you're having to have an idea of how much water should be supplied at each one of these green arrows? That's demand forecasting. Um, after you know the demands, then you can start optimizing both the location of the pipes and their sizing. And so what you want to do is minimize the length and diameter of pipe that's laid down. Like you wouldn't want, for example, it would be a dumb idea to have a pipe going from A to L and a separate pipe going straight from A to M and to go from A to O. You wouldn't have like a spoke system like that because that'd be too much length. But what you can do instead is have the pipe go from A to L and then M and then O. You know, you're going to be trying to place the pipes to minimize the overall length, but at the same time make the pipes just barely big enough so that at this high demand situation, the, the pressures don't drop too low. So it's an optimization process. Um, so demand forecasting is the thing. And what you'll notice is that the pipes have to be big enough to handle the larger of either the maximum hourly flow or the maximum daily flow plus the fire flows that are indicated. So that 
um, specifications file that everyone's going to have a different value for themselves. I'm going to be talking about how much fire flow you have to account for. Um, just the way that the regulations are written is that um, you have to consider what if a structure is on fire and provide enough capacity in your network so that the pressures don't drop when you have a huge demand for water because of a, uh, a structural fire. Well, that's the overview of the project. Um, any questions that come to mind right now? We'll have time throughout, I mean, at the beginning of every class period, as things come up, you can ask questions. And um, you'll notice that uh, the points are assigned half at the draft stage and then half at the final submission. And so when I see your draft calculations for the demand estimation, I'll give you feedback that then you can incorporate into revisions. And so um, the points are not, it's not like all at once at the end. But if you make mistakes along the way, you can correct it. And um, my hope is at the end of the project, when everybody's submitting their reports, I love to give out 100%. And I have given out, you know, I've had classes where you know, three quarters of the class got 100% on the final project because the network was optimized, the description of the uh, demand forecasting was clear, and so on. Um, this is probably, I think, the eighth time I've given this project. And so I've, over time, revised the assignment description pretty carefully. And everything I want you to know for now is here in this handout. So I'd really ask you to uh, read over it carefully, because understanding what it says on these three pages is really the baseline for uh, knowing what to do next. So what you should look for is in the coming days, I'm going to upload that specifications file of how much flow rate each one of you should be, uh, well, the, the uh, per capita, like um, population densities. So I'll send you that, uh, an email with that as an attachment, and also put it on MU Online when it's available. All right. So that's it for today. Just remember that uh, on Tuesday, we've got the midterm exam, and the assignment is due. Feel free to send me an email if you've got any questions uh, as you prepare for either. And I will see you on Tuesday.